Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. All right, it is now the top of the hour. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'm going to remember to, oh, great, we are, um, we are recording, fantastic. All right, well, hi everyone and welcome. Today's presentation is the third in our fall seminar series. We hope that you found this series interesting and informative. And if you were unable to attend our previous sessions, you can watch them anytime via our YouTube channel. And we'll put that link for you in the chat now. So my name is Julie Spear, and I'm delighted to be leading the session today. At any point, please feel free to use the chat in Zoom or raise your hand and unmute yourself to ask your questions or chime in to tell us what you do in your own educational settings. We all benefit from this collective knowledge of the group, so I hope you'll share your thoughts and your perspectives. In today's talk, we'll discuss ways to innovate the learning environment using educational technologies to promote equity and inclusion, and we'll reflect on our current practices and opportunities moving forward. We've created a handout that has some discussion prompts and additional resources for you, and we'll be sharing that handout in, at the first reflection point in a few minutes. I recently saw this graphic, and I thought it fit really well with this seminar series discussing innovative education and educational technologies. The creators of this graphic compare diversity, the unique identities, perspectives, and backgrounds that we each carry to hardware. Similarly, they compared inclusion to software. Inclusion describes the establishment of an environment that welcomes each person to, uh, and creates opportunities for us all to realize our full potential. Both diversity and inclusion are needed to achieve the goal of belongingness, where each student, faculty member, and staff member feel comfortable being their authentic selves. Today, we'll highlight three areas where we can think about bringing together diversity and inclusion to create belongingness in our classrooms. In the first section, we'll talk about tools for promoting equity and inclusion and how students access and engage with instructional content. How do you present your instructional content? Do you use videos, in-person or recorded lectures, written materials, including textbooks and journal articles or discussions, or a combination of all of these? Oops. <laughs> Please, to, uh, I'm gonna launch a Zoom poll and I'd love to hear what you guys do currently. Oops, wrong one. Sorry about that. All right, here we go. Feel free to chime in and share what you currently do in your classroom. Awesome. So we've got about half the people have shared Feel free, if you haven't, to share what you do um, in your classrooms. Do you use videos, in-person recorded lectures, written materials, discussions, or all of the above? You should be able to select multiple options. All right, we'll give everyone about 10 more seconds. All right, last chance, and I'm gonna end the poll. Great, 
so it looks like everyone, um, thank you for sharing. And it looks like we have really a great combination of all of these different approaches. Um, so we have nearly 90% uh, using some form of lecture, um, a, a majority using written materials, um, and then a combination of videos and discussions. Great. So let me just close that. Fantastic. So these modes are all great ways to disseminate information and engage our students, but they can also prevent challenges for equity and inclusion. Therefore, it's important to take time to be intentional with prepare, preparing our instructional content, which can help to promote equity and inclusion for all of our students. Let's first think about auditory content. According to a 2018 report from the Hearing Loss Association of America, while two to three out of every 1,000 newborns is born with hearing loss, one in five teenagers experiences some degree of hearing loss. And as many people may be familiar with, the risk increases with age and exposure to loud sounds. In fact, 60% of veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan come home with hearing loss or ringing in their ears. However, fewer than 20% of people with hearing loss seek treatment. This means that if the content is only delivered through one form, many students may be missing significant amounts of the classroom experience, including conversations, discussions, and educational content. There are several ways we can help to support all the learners engaging with the learning experience. First, though, I want to acknowledge that what works for one student may not work for another. So it's always best to ask students what, um, what will help promote an optimal environment for their own learning check in with your students frequently, and keep an open mind to suggestions. That said, when presenting auditory information, you might think about including a visual way for students to access that same material. You can do this in several ways, and in this image I'm showing a screenshot of content presented in Echo 360, a tool that Brittany Williams highlighted in her talk a few weeks ago. I know the text on this image is pretty small, but I want to point out that the viewer could engage with this content through the auditory information from the video, as well as by reading the text available through the closed captioning at the bottom of the screen and a full text transcript at the right of the screen. Let's talk about trans or captions first. Out of curiosity, how many of you turn on closed captioning when you watch a TV show or a movie at home? If you do, can you give me a thumbs up if you have your video on, or you can use the reaction features in Zoom. Remember the reaction options appear in the bottom toolbar of Zoom and the icon looks like a smiley face with a plus sign. Awesome, so I'm seeing some thumbs up, I'm seeing some shaking heads. Great. So for those who may be less familiar, this feature appears as text generally at the bottom of the screen. Many video sources, including YouTube, have the option to toggle the closed captionings on or off. In contrast to captions, a transcript shows the full text of a video, almost like a script. When it's available, this usually shows up below or next to a video as you're seeing here. Both these tools, captions and transcripts, allow students to visually engage with the content as well uh, that was originally only auditory. One note is that auto-generated transcripts and captions may not be 100% accurate, so we want to test them in advance. You can often edit them, and we can discuss whether they're ADA compliant with the experts, including the amazing learning and disability resources staff here at ATSU. These may be tools that can help students who have hearing loss or hearing impairments understand the content of the video and can help all learners as well. For example, having transcripts or captions on helps students who may be studying in environments where they're unable to keep their volume up due to it being a shared workspace like a library. Additionally, think about a student who might be in the back of the room and sitting further from a speaker. Being able to read along with listening to the video can help any student and can help compensate for low audio quality or background noises in the room. Utilizing these tools can increase the likelihood that students will feel included and welcomed in our classrooms and will connect with us as instructors and with the material that we're presenting. Before I move on, it looks like th someone has their hand raised. Do you wanna ask a, a question? I wonder if that wasn't related to your question uh, about- oh, about captions? Those, those captions? Awesome, no worries. Well, if you do have a question, feel free to put it in the chat um, or you, uh, we'll come back. Um, in just a few minutes for more questions. Just like you can turn captions on for videos, you can also enable live auto captioning in Zoom. From the Zoom settings on your account online, you can enable this feature. And once you do, the button to toggle the captions on or off will appear at the bottom toolbar in your Zoom window. You and your Zoom room participants can each turn on the captions or transcript for your own viewing. And you can either enable or disable participants from saving the transcript based on your course context. 
What's great about this is that the text will be auto-generated and captures the dialogue spoken by any of the room's participants, not only the host. I've enabled this feature in today's meeting, so if you uh, see the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, feel free to try it out. Similarly, for asynchronous meetings or classes, you can record content in Zoom and include the transcripts and caption options for people viewing the recording. In this case, not only does the transcript option promote accessibility, but it helps all users and is a great tool for studying. Viewers can search the transcript for particular keywords and then clicking on the line in the transcript that will allow them to jump in the video to that moment where those words were said. These are some simple ways to make audio content more inclusive to all learners. To learn more about how to use the captioning or transcripts in your classroom, you can check out the additional resources we have linked to the handout that we'll share soon. Additionally, if your students, you have students who might benefit from viewing subtitles in a language other than English, there are options for that as well. Feel free to schedule a consultation with the TLC to discuss these options. Now I wanna switch gears a little bit to think about how we portray visual content. Often, a lot of our educational content is visual and can often be color coded as well. But while these color codings can be helpful, not everyone sees color the same way. Approximately one in 12 people assigned male at birth and one in 200 people assigned female at birth have some form of color blindness. This means that statistically, it's likely that at least one of our students will see color differently. While there are several forms of color blindness, the most common is red-green color deficiency. Here's a graphic showing common colors. On the left, the graphic shows colors as seen by an individual who does not have a color deficiency. And on the right, we may be able to see how an individual with red-green color deficiency would see those same colors. As you may appreciate, the red and green colors look strikingly similar to each other, which can pose challenges because oftentimes information is coded in green and red. In particular, red is often used for grading purposes or red and green arrows might be used to point out different features on a PowerPoint slide but someone who can't distinguish those colors might be missing out on critical information. So you may consider using a few techniques to support all learners accessing your content. One step we can take is just choosing more accessible colors. Instead of using red and green as our contrasting colors, we might think about using yellow and blue or red and blue, which may be more accessible options. Additionally, it's best practice to avoid using only color to distinguish the features of our content. As you can see in this graphic, we can distinguish features in several ways, including using textures and patterns, adding in icons, and instead of using different colors to accent text, consider bolding instead. These practices, again, not only help individuals who have color blindness, but they increase the readability of figures and content in general. Lastly, we can check our content for accessibility. There are many tools available to do this, but here I'm showing one where you simply use the URL of your content, and then you can choose filters that allow you to view your content the way an individual with different types of colorblindness might see it. We'll share this link for the tool in the chat, and you'll also find it on the handout. As we discussed, inequities can arise when content is delivered through one form only. Utilizing technology, we can intentionally create opportunities for our students to engage with the materials through multiple formats. The goal here is to both promote equity and inclusion while increasing clarity and comprehension for all. Now let's take time to begin to think about an action plan for our own teaching and learning context. Let's take about a minute to start this process by thinking about the current practices we use in content delivery and what you might do, we might do differently to increase equity in how our students access our materials. We've given space for you to collect your thoughts in the handout, but you can brainstorm in a different way if that would be more helpful to you. This is a place to jot down ideas and you can always come back later. And it's just for you. We will not be collecting these handouts. So let's take about a minute and then we'll come back together as a group. All right, so let's um, come back together, finish up uh, jotting some ideas down. Um, would anyone like to share what they do currently or ideas they might have for the future? 
uh, feel free to come off mute or put your ideas in the chat. And I'll start uh, by just saying uh, the I found it interesting about the statistic about colorblindness and the color usage, right? Uh, we, as an instructor, as educators, sometimes we always think red, uh, you know, gets their attention and is a great way to give feedback, corrective feedback, especially if they've done something wrong. And but I can never reconcile the number that I've heard almost my whole life about the number of people who are impacted by colorblindness. And so by doing that, they now I'm putting it in their hands, the students' hands to potentially have to compensate for my decision to use red. Uh, and depending on the format, they might not even see it. They might not even see my comment um, without, without assistance. So uh, I think that being able to look at my instructional materials um, uh, from PDFs to websites, especially websites, that's an awesome resource that I will use from now on to just look at it from a different perspective. Uh, I'm really glad you shared that. Thank you. And thanks for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, the link that we shared for that tool to check the content, like I said, it's just one of many out there. Um, so there are actually even Chrome plugins you can um, download and install, um, which make it even easier for you to just be uh, more cognizant of how those color choices um, might might look differently to, to some folks in your class. So thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, we see I see something in the chat. Use red or orange with blue arrows instead of red and green arrows on PowerPoints. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, so there's um, some resources in that handout um, that link to um, really full palettes of colors, um, including multiple um, shades and, and all sorts of contrasting colors um, that would be more accessible options. So fantastic. Thank you so much. For, for sharing your thoughts. So moving into um, our next phase, at ATSU, we know there's a strong belief in whole person healthcare. Similarly, I wanna propose the idea of whole person education. In this next, next phase, we'll discuss inviting students to participate in the learning environment as their full selves. You may remember a previous presentation by Dr. Trish Sexton. She reminded us that we each hold a number of identities. Some of these may be visible or invisible. They may carry privilege or be minoritized. Some of these may be established and others may be more fluid or dynamic. Oftentimes, aspects of our identities intersect in different ways. And we often talk about aspects of identity such as gender or race and physical ability, but in fact, identity extends beyond these to include many factors, including socioeconomic status, spirituality, family status, citizenship, our work experiences, and our life experiences. The text on the slide is small, so please don't feel like you have to read every item, but I wanted to include this graphic because it, because it begins to demonstrate how multifactorial identity is. Remember that we're not only one aspect aspect of ourselves. They combine to all make us who we are. And since we're made up all of, these, of all of these aspects of our own identity, we can't assume that our students come to class as empty slates. As educators, it's important that we celebrate and respect the diversity of our students and those of ourselves and intentionally create inclusive environments and design opportunities to leverage our students' funds of knowledge to enhance and deepen the learning experience. Today, I'm going to highlight two tools for promoting discussion and collaboration, Flipgrid and Padlet. These tools can be used to create spaces where students can share their ideas and insights based on their personal experiences and allow students the opportunity to share their voices and to express themselves. Has anyone heard of Flipgrid or Padlet? If you have, can you react with a thumbs up in Zoom? Seeing a couple thumbs up, awesome. Uh, Dr. Bacon, how do you use, uh, do you use Flipgrid or Padlet or both? Uh, so I've used both. Um, I really like Flipgrid because you can have students interact for a short period of time, 60 seconds, and then you can merge all of the videos together. So for a large group of students, instead of having them click on, you know, X number of individual videos, they can just click on it once and see everyone incorporated into one video. Um, and then I've used Padlet just as a brainstorming uh, space. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Yeah, so sneak preview of my next couple slides, fantastic. 
So I want to talk about Flipgrid first. Um, at its core, Flipgrid is an interactive platform for video discussions. Instructors can pose questions or topics for students to consider. Then using a mobile device or camera with a microphone, students can engage in a dialogue by posting their own videos in response to the prompt. Or you can use this by replying to a post from a peer. This tool can be used to create an engaging dialogue with students who are meeting in person and those who may be joining the classroom community from different cities, states, and zip codes. Students can record or re-record, sorry, time zones, not zip codes. <laughs> students can record or re-record as many times as they like, which may help create an environment where more students feel comfortable sharing their voices. Additionally, students can customize the video experiences or choose to use their microphone only. So this tool can be used to bring all students' thoughts and ideas to the table and welcomes diversity of background, thoughts, and training. This tool is free to instructors and students and is e easy to use. And as a plus, Flipgrid can be integrated right into your class's Canvas page, making it easily available to your students. You might consider this tool for when you introduce yourself to your class and when you ask your students to introduce themselves to you and their peers before the class begins. Or like we heard from Dr. Bacon, it's a great tool to use throughout class as well. Students can brainstorm together, hear diverse perspectives, and work together remotely via Flipgrid. Think about how you might be able to integrate Flipgrid into your own teaching. Could students present case reports, morning huddles, discuss challenges and rewarding moments from clinical rotations. There are so many ways to creatively incorporate this tool into medical education. And in your teaching, you may have previously invited students to write ideas on a whiteboard or work in groups to create uh, ideas on poster paper. Padlet is a tool that offers a way to promote similar engagement using online pages rather than a physical whiteboard. Here I'm showing you screenshots of two different Padlet boards. And again, I know the text is small, but I really just want you to see how Padlet could look by highlighting a few ways you might use this tool in your teaching. Padlet allows users to create virtual posts, comment on or react to these, share links, images, and videos to form and form connections between ideas. <clears throat> students can also up or down vote posts, which can help you see where students might have common questions. I also wanna note that Padlet both supports anonymous posting and allows instructors to require a login to participate. So there's a lot of flexibility in how students can engage with this platform. And as you can imagine, this tool has applications for both asynchronous and synchronous learning for a variety of uses, such as brainstorming ideas, conducting collaborative note-taking, polling your students or asking for feedback, creating individual or group concept maps, conducting exit activities or other comprehension checks, and can be used for virtual or in-person Q&A and office hours. Like Flipgrid, Padlet is another great tool for promoting dialogue and collaboration among students and creating opportunities for students to draw from their personal experiences and skills, especially because many students may feel more empowered to write their thoughts rather than raise their hand and speak them out loud. So this is a great way of enabling all students to contribute and collaborate together. These two tools are amongst many that can help students fully engage anywhere, anytime, and to share their thoughts, ideas, and perspectives, informed by their unique experiences and their full identities. However, underlying this is a need for good, thought-provoking questions and the cultivation of an environment in your classroom where you've welcomed your students to participate as their full selves and have established norms or ground rules for respect respectful dialogue and discussion. Let's again take time to continue to think about our action plan for our own teaching and learning context. Like before, take a minute or so to reflect on what you currently do in your classroom to support whole person education and what you might do moving forward to cultivate inclusivity and leverage your students' funds of knowledge. And again, we'll put the link to that handout in the chat where you can begin to brainstorm. All right, let's take just a few more seconds to collect thoughts. And I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Wasden, do you wanna share um, something that you were thinking of in this section? 
we're um, in person or hoping to be in person. So I, I was thinking more through the, the issues with the uh, color and I really appreciate that. I had not even thought of that before. So I wanna go through my slides and review those. And, um, but as far as the video, I, I really don't know how to incorporate that into our in-person lectures, but I'd be up for some ideas. Yeah, it's a great question. And actually, um, you know, we're happy to talk about that in individually. Um, but one great thing that you could do is enable your subtitles for slides that you're presenting. Um, so that allows people, you know, who may uh, particularly um, appreciate being able to read along with hearing what you're saying, um, that might help people engage as well. Thanks for sharing. And Dr. Omar, I see that you put um, a PDF in the chat. Do you want to um, share a little bit about that? Thanks, thanks, Julie. Actually, I just want to uh, share what what technologies or what educational uh, technologies we are using in the dental school. So we are using uh, Padlet as a tool to engage the students in some collaborative work, and uh, we we are using also a, a Mentimeter, which is some sort of a poll everywhere. Uh, it's helpful in in, but it's it's just. I, I found it more easy to use, and it captured the students in a word cloud. So if you are, if there is, if there are a series of topics, and you want to know which topics are more difficult for the students that you need to emphasize on or provide more uh, educational resources for these topics, you can use the the word cloud. So the biggest word will be the ones that most of the students have have put in their uh, feedback. Uh, it also creates uh, charts uh, and a lot of uh, additional information. Another tool we are using, which is uh, uh, Articulate uh, 360, uh, which is, but this, this requires a subscription. It creates interactive courses. So you can use it in a, in a different way to, to address. It's very useful in case scenarios. And if the students are required to generate treatment plans and look into uh, cases and identify and diagnose and, and look into uh, different aspects of cases. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And yeah, I'm seeing other, other of your colleagues also use Mentimeter. Um, so it's really exciting to see how that can be used. And I agree with you that world, word cloud feature is really great um, because it allows you to see mm -hmm. where those common themes are um, and also, um, like you said, yeah, lots of different plots and different tools um, that you can use in Mentimeter. So, oh, yep, great. The library uses it as well. Yeah, it's an awesome tool. Um, so not one that I specifically highlighted um, in this session, um, but it's, it absolutely fits in right here with this theme um, because it really allows um, all students to share their voice um, and, um, and to engage in the classroom. So thank you so much. Oh, and um, I see a, a question. So um, we were talking about Padlet and Flipgrid um, in the slides, and then we were talking about Mentimeter um, through, um, through our discussion. So great, thank you everyone uh, for sharing. So in this final segment, we'll discuss ways to empower our students by including representations of diversity, of the diversity in our community and in our disciplines. Representation matters, and it's important to consider what we are choosing to represent or not represent with pictures and graphics, videos and recordings, print materials and resources, and who we invite as guest speakers or panelists. These choices can empower our students by allowing them to see folks like themselves as active, valued, and contributing members of our disciplines. Our choices can show our students what is possible, what we value and respect, and can help our students feel welcome to show up as their full selves in the classroom. They can also center historically underrepresented or marginalized voices and perspectives. Therefore, we wanna be intentional about the visuals we're using and the stories we're telling in our classrooms. Furthermore, we want to model professional behaviors and attitudes for our students. One great tool for finding or updating our visual representations is Shutterstock. This database has nearly endless options for photographs, stock images, and illustrations, including curated collections on healthcare imagery. Better yet, at ATSU, the communications and marketing team can help us access the full watermark-free content that you identify using this resource. Yeah, I'm seeing some thumbs up. It's a really great tool. 
While Shutterstock is a great resource for many graphics, the platform itself is not specifically geared towards the health sciences. However, there are several resources which are focused on increasing representation in the health science disciplines. Today, I'm going to specifically discuss Mind the Gap and Visual DX. Mind the Gap was a project started by Malone McQuende. As a Black medical student, Malone was acutely aware that he was being taught about clinical symptoms largely from Caucasian patients, and he wondered how well he and his peers would be prepared to treat all patients. So he worked with faculty to develop a platform to showcase clinical signs and symptoms on Black and Brown skin. His team created a free handbook that you and your students can use, and the Black and Brown skin team are working to continually increase diversity in the uh, medical imagery. And we have linked to this resource in the handout, but we'll also put it in the chat now. And they're actually working to crowdsource um, images and continually expand these offerings. <clears throat> Has anyone heard of Visual DX? If you have, can you react with a thumbs up in Zoom? Yeah, awesome. So I'm seeing some thumbs up. I'm seeing some um, nodding of heads. Fantastic. So this is a tool that's available through ATSU via the library, and we'll put the link for it in the chat now. It's a website and an app that supports problem-oriented support for differential diagnoses, testing, and therapeutic decisions. This platform has thousands of images used to support the medical decision-making, and in fact, Visual DX is invested in including medical imagery that shows symptoms as they appear on a range of skin tones. I do want to note that this tool does not highlight diversity in all its forms, including gender and sexual orientation. So we're putting another link in the chat for clinical case studies that include patient scenarios that represent a range of intersecting identities. But remember, it's important to be careful when using and creating case studies to highlight diverse lived experiences, but not in a way that it's based in or propagates harmful stereotypes. It's also been well documented that women authors and scholars are cited less frequently than their male peers. <clears throat> Similarly, scholars of color are cited less frequently than their white colleagues. So we also have opportunities to be intentional about the representation when it comes to the written resources we provide to our students. There are now tools available, like the one you're seeing here, that allow you to check the gender balance in lists of texts. For example, you can insert the citation of journal articles you're asking your students to read and use this tool to get a barometer and a sense of who you're putting in front of your students. And that allows you to question whether that is truly representative of the diversity in your field. As we've discussed, the instructional content in our, in our classes can empower our students, create an inclusive environment, and prepare students to engage with and effectively treat all patients. So let's conclude again by taking a minute to think about our action plan for our own teaching and learning context. Currently, what voices, graphics, or images do you use in your instruction? And what steps can you take to continually improve representation and inclusion in your teaching? So take about a minute and then we'll come back together as a group. All right, let's take a couple more seconds to jot down some thoughts. And while we're doing so, uh, Dr. Misra, would you share, um, I see you put a number of great resources in the chat and I'd love to hear a little bit more about them and how you use them. Certainly, so, um, you know, uh, and I realized it was a little bit after we were talking about the use of imagery and you had mentioned Shutterstock, but one of the challenges always um, prior for me to working with the college was how do you find good um, open access or royalty free um, imagery artwork and things like that. Um, I found that um, unsplash.com is a fantastic site that has um, 
high resolution images that are uh, community sourced and contributed. They're all uh, essentially free for utilization. That all they ask is that you uh, you make a citation somewhere in the slide deck um, for the image. The wonderful thing is they have very high resolution images. You can scale down to whatever size you need. Size you need. The other interesting one is the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art. Their entire art collection is actually open access and free to use. Um, and while neither of those are um, uh, medicine specific, what I found is that you can get really creative with your searches there to find excellent visual metaphors and things like that. that um, I, and I've had a lot of a positive effect with learners who have told me that some of the imagery I've used has been very, very effective for conveying ideas, concepts that are more um, challenging in words. As you pointed out too, we have a lot of learners who, you know, I, I had one student who came to me and said that they struggled with um, dyslexia for a long time, but that they did much, much better with my presentations because they incorporated a larger volume of visual imagery to convey ideas, meanings, and metaphors and things like that. So that was some of the stuff that um, I thought was useful to share with the group. The last thing I'll point out is when you started talking about colors for highlighting and slides and things like that, I actually did have a physician come to me at a um, convention that I'd given a presentation at and said, you know, I loved your presentation, but I couldn't understand anything because uh, that was important because you'd highlighted everything um, in colors that I couldn't see. And since that time, I've, I've always been very conscientious to make sure I use colors that colorblind people are able to see. Thank you so much for sharing those experiences and those resources. Um, I think we've all, you know, we've all done that of, of picking colors that look, you know, look great, um, but not everyone can see. Um, and it, it's uh, like you said, um, it's one of those things that we can do intentionally moving forward um, to support, um, you know, a majority of people who will be looking at the presentation. Um, so thank you for sharing that um, and for sharing how your students have benefited from having more visuals in in your um, in your presentations and in your slides. Um, that's really cool to hear about. Um, we also saw um, Dr. Skinner. Do you want to share as well? You used a, a identified a different resource, right? looks like Dr. Skinner shared about Pexels, um, which also has a number of diverse images. So thank you for putting that in the chat. Um, I'm very excited to go learn more about all of these resources. And I did not know that about the Met Museum. So that is very cool to know. So thank you so much. So I want to now bring back one of my first slides. Today, we've discussed how as educators, we have an opportunity to intentionally create inclusive and equitable learning opportunities that leverage the diversity of our students and the diverse identities that we as educators hold. In doing so, we not only support students who may have less privilege or who may have been previously minoritized, but we all benefit as individuals, as classes and communities, and as disciplines in the health sciences. I hope that we can leave today's session with three takeaways. First, our choices can create a welcoming environment that empower our learners. We can also create opportunities that set all of our learners up for success. And we can invite our students to draw from their backgrounds and this can help deepen the learning experience for the whole classroom. So we will stay on and uh, happy to engage with the conversation and learn more about what everyone uh, does. Oh, no problem, Dr. Skinner. Actually, this is a great point. So um, I see that you said your computer froze, um, but I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about Pexel um, that you put in the chat. Oh, sure. I, it's just another site because I, I think it's great to hear about Shutterstock, but it, it might there might not be a, a, you know, I might be preparing something in a more timely fashion than ability to get those images. Uh, and so Pexels does have royalty free use of images and they do have a lot of diversity in their images, both in oh, terms of, um, of, of nationalities or race, gender, as well as sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's a good resource. Great, thank uh, you so much. I have another question or comment. Mm -hmm. If that's okay, it looks of like course. my computer's acting weird again. But what if, what's your, what are your thoughts on rec uh, making recorded lectures available? I hear that some students find that beneficial, and it's not necessarily everybody's practice. But yeah. it seems like an access thing to me. Yeah, it's a really great question. I know that a lot of um, of people have differing perspectives on it, um, especially given. Um, 
you know, the intellectual um, property and, and making, you know, the, the content um, available to our students, but not wanting that dispersed um, widely. Um, so I know that there are some, you know, some concerns about that. I think that, um, as, as I've talked about, it can really help students to be able to go back and review. Um, it can help a lot of students to have um, PowerPoints available in advance for students who may want to read through it to kind of have a, a starting off point, right, to join in the conversation. Um, so there's lots of ways that it can be um, helpful to students to have those materials um, both before the class and, and after. Um, so I think to me, a, a really you know, great thing to think about is setting up you know, expectations with your students. This is how I expect you to, to use it. Um, this is, I want you to, um, you know, if you're not enrolled in the class, this is not a material that, that should be shared or maybe it is a material that you're happy to share. You know, people have um, you know, friends and, and colleagues um, in other institutions, maybe that would be a resource that you're willing to share. So I think there are lots of things to consider with it. It's a, it's a really great question. I don't have one answer, um, but I think um, especially things that can be on Canvas, you, know, you can change permissions on whether or not things can be downloaded or not. Um, so that's one way of keeping it kind of behind um, a login and, and, but still within the learning management system. Um, so there's lots of ways that um, depending on what you see the opportunity and where you think some of those challenges might be that we can, you know, there's definitely a solution to find um, and a balance there. So happy, you know, um, happy to talk with anyone about what that might look like in your class. Um, and I see a hand raised, um, so feel free to, to chime in here. Yeah, just on that topic, you know, um, I think I, it's something I regularly encounter if I'm giving presentations is, you know, what, what can be shared out and who. I always try to say up front, you know, what are the stipulations? Most of the time, my stipulations are that, you know, it's free to share in its original form. It's not free to share in a modified form. And if you share it, it has to, you have to attribute it um, to, you know, the original source, i.e. me or the college. The other thing I'll point out is if you use any sort of handouts like PDF handouts, there are ways to password protect PDF handouts. Um, obviously, that, that's a, a small layer of security, but it can be useful to prevent something that, you know, gets uploaded to a file server or, or onto, you know, and I've seen that happen where material has been uploaded to like a general server. So password protection on PDFs does make that added layer of security to prevent something from being shared that you don't want shared. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's a really great point. Um, I think, like you said, setting up that expectation about what is what is free to use, right, free to share, um, where would you like that credit to go um, if someone is sharing that? Those are really, really great points. So fantastic. All right. So um, like I mentioned, I'm going to conclude with um, giving some important announcements, um, but then happy um, would be delighted if people wanted to share um, things that they're thinking about for their action plan um, moving forward or things they do now um, after I get through these, these final announcements. So I want to truly thank all of you for attending today's session and for your participation. If you missed any of the excellent talks in the series on innovation in health science education, or if you want to catch up on previous TLC uh, presentations, you can watch those on our YouTube channel. And I see that um, Brittany put those into the chat. So thank you so much. Um, and like I said, I really invite you to continue to reflect on the topics that we touched on today. And if you want to discuss ideas for your own teaching, please feel free to schedule an individual consultation with us. Lastly, I want to let you know about an exciting thing that's upcoming. Um, the ATSU Innovation in Teaching for Learning Award finalist presentations are coming up. The finalist videos will soon be available for viewing between November 1st and the 12th, and you can watch the presentations and vote for your favorite. And the voting will contribute to finalists' overall scores. So we really encourage you to, um, to join in, to watch those videos, support your colleagues, and learn about innovation at ATSU. And then please do join us on November 17th when we announce this year's winner. So please keep an eye out for more information soon. We promise that is soon to be distributed. And we hope you'll explore your colleagues' innovative teaching techniques and participate in this community of innovation at ATSU. So before uh, people jump off um, and before we engage again in more discussion, I want to thank you for coming today and for your participation. 
Great, thank you uh, to Brittany and to uh, Quincy for putting links um, in the chat. Um, and I'd love to hear about more things that are that people are doing in, in their classrooms related to any of the three topics or really anything else um, uh, related to equity and inclusion um, or things that you're thinking you might do moving forwards. Yeah, of course, please. Um, you know, one of the things that I found very, very helpful for myself was to better educate myself a little bit on the concept of microaggressions, um, which is something probably many of you have heard about, maybe even have studied. Um, I found that once I better understood what microaggressions were, it was easier for me to identify them and um, avoid them in presentations. And as we talked about, like when we use particular stereotypes or particular, you know, um, stereotypical imagery, whether we realize it or not, we're really contributing to that concept of microaggression and moving ourselves away from that concept of equity and inclusion. So, so um, uh, I think it's fantastic to, to learn a little bit about microaggressions and better understand how those work. The other thing I will say that has been really helpful for me anecdotally is I think it's really wonderful when you've put together a presentation, have somebody else look at the presentation for you. Um, I mean, that's just a generally a good educational concept to begin with. But if you tell them specifically, you know, that you want them to look at it, you know, from the standpoint of like equity inclusion, and if they've been similarly trained as they have today by our fantastic series, you know, it, it, it helps you to sometimes get another viewpoint and maybe see something that you missed before. I can tell you, with the number of the state organizations that I work with, where we're putting on local and national and state level conferences, many of those organizations now have a committee, um, usually it's the conference committee that actually reviews presentations specifically for elements related to this that may be potentially um, seen as you know, um, not equitable, not diverse, or, or, or not promoting those things, or, or moving us away from them, I should say. And, and it's amazing how, one, how many you'll find at, when you're looking for it. And two, what we found is that when we reach out to those people in a compassionate and instructional way, most of them are not resentful. Most of them are like, thank you so much. I didn't even see that. So I think that's another thing that's really, really important is to recognize that if you do, you are asked to review something and you find something that's questionable to take a tone of constructive, like partnering, engaging with them to make them feel like, okay, we can fix this. Because what we found is that people do become defensive when they feel like someone's calling them, you know, a racist or calling them exclusive exclusionary and that wasn't their intent at all right yeah those are really excellent points um at the tlc we're all about peer feedback all about getting feedback in in all capacities um so that's a really fantastic point and i i think um it's an it's a, such an important thing to be proactive right like you were saying to have someone else look at it in advance um and then i'd also like to follow up by reminding us um things happen, right? We make mistakes. We say things that are taken in a way that was not not how we intended them. And it's important to, uh, that happens in our classrooms or in our communities, um, to, to acknowledge that, to acknowledge that um, harm may have been done that you didn't intend. Um, and I think that's really important to model for our students, right? That can be, um, be a, a Sometimes a, a you know a fearful you, as an instructor you're not sure how to have that conversation but it's important to model to our students um, how to engage in in that dialogue and to um, to grow and and um, to do that together so yeah absolutely I see that um, you put in the chat acknowledge and apologize and be accountable absolutely um, all really excellent points thank you. So I see um, Dr. Bree uh, Finkley Strickland. Um, any thoughts on today's session? We haven't caught up in a while. I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. I just finished a conference last week from the PAEA um, forum, education forum, and there was quite a bit on, um, you know, uh, justice. Um, equity, inclusion, diversity, and there was quite a bit in education and this just really impact and um, just reinforce the importance. And um, I like what Quincy said, it's not just about connecting with one student, 
but it's about making that formative change in education that we need to make that makes it inclusive for all students and that they all feel like they have a place at the table. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I love what you said, formative change. And um, I think, you know, brings us back to um, what Brittany was sharing with us last week about, you know, about formative um, change and how we can continually do better, right? It's uh, continually learn and grow and to help our students and our, and our, our, our disciplines do that. So thank you so much. I see a, a note in the chat um, about the live transcript. Yes, I, I love it. I think it is really helpful. Um, I turn captions on when I watch pretty much anything. Um, and so I think it's so great to have, have it in, in the, the synchronous settings as well. Um, I'm a note taker. Um, and so often I'm looking down and I miss a detail, right? And I can go back and I can look at that caption or the transcript. Um, and I don't know, has, has anyone used the, the transcript feature to be able to search through a video? Yes, I see hands raised. I think it is incredible. I mean, how much time have we all, I'm sure, cumulatively spent going back and trying to find something in a video, right? Oh my goodness, <laughs> so much time to do that and to find those things and to be able to go and identify those keywords. Oh, I miss this formula or I miss this definition and go straight there. It's such a great study tool. Julie, to your point about captions, I would 100% agree. And some of the pushback I've heard about transcripts is, oh, you know, if, if the transcript doesn't pick up my accent or if they miss a word, true. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be perfect. If I'm following along with the transcript, and I've heard students say the same thing, as long as the context is there, sometimes that's enough just to keep them on track. Um, so I, I wouldn't stress about changing every single little word, unless maybe it's a super specific word that you need them to know. I would just say, let it flow, and the, the context alone might be enough. Yeah, and a lot of the tools to um, to edit those for recordings are really pretty simple. So you can go in and just uh, update, like you said, if maybe it was a really important term, right, or something that that it, it didn't do a great job of capturing. Um, those are pretty easy to edit, um, and then your students have that that transcript to to use in their studying. Awesome, and yeah, thank you so much for sharing that link um, in the chat for um, for the tools for Zoom. That's fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. And I think that the tools are getting, and Dean, you can correct me on this, but I think they're only getting better, right? The AI and, and all of that to help support doing those, those auto-generated captions. I'm sure they're only improving as time goes on. Yeah, definitely. It's, they're learning as they go. Um, uh, Echo 360 also has the ability to add um, transcriptioning to their recordings. Uh, and if you want to set that up, you can contact me and I can help you with that as well. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Both Zoom and Echo, um, those are tools that, that can be used and actually um, PowerPoint online as well. Um, the Office 365 version of PowerPoint allows you to enable auto-generated transcripts in, um, I don't know exactly how many, but I'd say um, at least uh, 50 languages. Um, so that is a great tool um, for making that available for students who um, might prefer to read subtitles in a language other than English. Um, great question. Um, Dr. Conley asks, are there other educational technologies that we should consider that could help creating an inclusive learning experience? And I will turn that over to the group, um, the collective knowledge here. Other tools or technologies that you think of or have used in your classrooms? So this is a, a simple one, but I immediately think of Google Docs. Um, if my students are collaboratively taking notes and one student maybe didn't hear something or if the transcript didn't catch it and another student caught it, I could see that being something that could support their learning. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, I think instead of feeling competition, right, between who took the best notes, we can all be better, right? We can all learn uh, when we, from, from everyone else's notes. And <laughs> yeah, I see a comment in the chat about dialogue. Um, <laughs> um, yes, we can, um, we can share those. We can do collaborative note-taking. It's a big um, approach in a lot of um, educational contexts um, to, to do those collaborative notes and to learn from each other and each other's perspectives and, and use that as a, as a study tool. 
So Google Docs, absolutely. Yes, like you said, it helped a big fan building community. Fantastic. Great. Are there other tools that people are thinking of? Uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Dr. Bliven, anything coming to mind we haven't already mentioned? I'm calling people out, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, I'm learning a lot, so thank you. No worries. It's so good, good to hear from, from everyone. Um, with videos off, it's hard to tell sometimes um, if people are nodding or <laughs> what everyone's thinking. But um, yes, absolutely. Um, these are some great tools that we've learned from, from folks in the session today. Um, I am so excited to go back and look at all of these icons and new pictures I can find. Um, I'm, you know, I know what I'm doing this week and I'm going to go through the Met, the whole Met. <laughs> um, fantastic you're you're going to be a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's something like 1.2 million images, but their search engine is fantastic. And, uh, and, and again, I, I think recognizing that, you know, it, it really helps you to flex yourself creati creatively speaking, which I think is another thing that um, often basic science and even clinical faculty get tagged, you know, by learners about is like, you know, this is very um, dry. And, and I think when you can engage them in a creative fashion, um, I'll put a plug in for um, something that I use as, has been my, I'm, I'm a big presentation nerd. Um, and one of my favorite um, authors is Gar Reynolds, G-A-R-R, -R, last name is Reynolds. And um, his, um, he, he has three books. The first one is called Presentation Zen. And the second one is called, uh, pres uh, I think, Presenta uh, Zen Design. And the third one is called The Na Naked Presenter. They are fantastic books for anyone who's looking for how to, how to develop presentations that are more engaging and, and, and better use of imagery and stories and even looking at things like slide themes and colors and stuff like that. And so while that is somewhat tangential to our discussion today, I think overall, all of that really, really um, matters when we're talking about this particular topic and the larger topic of how do we effectively communicate knowledge with one another. That is a fantastic resource. Um, and they all sound like fantastic, fantastic reads. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if, if we're thinking about um, from an equity and inclusion perspective, think about a, a slide that has, you know, size eight font to get all the bullets to fit. You know, that's not um, a way that a lot of uh, students and a lot of um, audience members are going to be able to um, really hone in on what are the important things to take away from that slide. Um, so absolutely, those um, better presentations, better visuals, and like you said, creativity, it's so important. Um, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. No worries. I see some people have to drop off, um, but I really appreciate you being here today and sharing your thoughts and perspectives. So thank you so much.